from it. Uh, I like occasionally to do a bit of Lego. The girls are very good at Lego. I brought some of my Duplo this morning. And I've got some pictures of Lego. And this is something I made last night. This is one of my creations. I think you'll agree. It's pretty special. It's got a nice safari feel. Got some nice flowers. Um, Lego in my hands. This is what is, is made. But you get some people who are amazing at Lego. Anybody here? Lego fans? Technic? Oh, okay, yes, we're the children at the back. And... Um, <laughs> But if you, if you go to Legoland, if you've been to Legoland, some of the things you can see there, this is a replica of, uh, I think, St. Paul's Cathedral, made out of Lego pieces. Uh, this is the Taj Mahal. You can see it, incredible detail and scale on that one. And uh, there's a couple more. This is Singapore Harbour. And there's some boats. Uh, there's even a big wheel. And uh, finally, I think, is there one more? Oh, it's back to mine. There we are. Uh, finish on a high. So it's interesting, isn't it? You know, the same thing, Lego, a piece of Lego in different hands. In my hands, you get this kind of weird uh, safari tower. But in the hands of a real expert, you can get the Taj Mahal, you can get St. Paul's Cathedral, you can get these masterpieces. It just depends who you give the Lego to. And in our chapter today, Matthew 14, we see that the, the disciples have some bread rolls brioche rolls, uh, these ones, probably a different bread they had, and they had some fish. I've brought some sardines and some anchovies. Now, in my hands, after the service, we could maybe four of us sit down to a fish roll. Maybe a couple of people could, could have the rolls. It wouldn't be very much. But in Jesus' hands, a few rolls, a couple of fish, they fed 5,000 people, and there was more left over. So it depends into whose hands you give things. And we're going to think about the passage in a bit more detail, but effectively it's the same with our lives. In our own hands we can do certain things with our lives, but if we bring ourselves to Jesus and put ourselves in his hands, he can, we're told, do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine in us to change us, to be like him, and through us to bless and to serve others. So into whose lives are we putting our hands? Are we just keeping them to ourselves? Or are we entrusting ourselves to Jesus like this lad entrusted his food to Jesus and seeing how he might bless us and how he might bless others through us? Well, we're going to sing about the mighty works of God. We're not going to sing. We're going to listen to others singing as we listen together to Psalm 105. You've maybe heard of the street artist Banksy, the mysterious artist who paints graffiti on buildings and usually increases the value of the building significantly. His um, works sell for millions of pounds. There was a couple who were about to sell a house and he painted on their wall and they decided not to sell it for the original price. And I think he did one recently on a hospital, was it Southampton? And it raised a fortune for the hospital to spend on uh, the response to the pandemic. So Banksy, this very famous uh, artist in Britain, but nobody really knows who he is, or or she, who knows? Uh, Their identity is a mystery. And uh, people say, who is this man? Who is this artist? A lot of questions about their identity. And in Matthew 13 and 14, what we find is people have questions about Jesus' identity. It's a new section in Matthew's Gospel. We know that because in chapter 1353, it has that refrain, when he'd finished these parables, he went away from there. Jesus teaches his disciples, and then he moves on, that repeated pattern in Matthew's Gospel. And in this section, one of the key questions is, who is Jesus? It's asked several times. When he comes into uh, his own town and he preaches there. In verse 55, people say, is not this the carpenter's son? When John the Baptist, uh, rather when King Herod hears about him, chapter 14, verse 2, he says, this is John the Baptist. And when Jesus uh, gathers his disciples in chapter 16, 13, he says to them, who do people say that I am? 
So there is this question of Jesus' identity. Maybe you read in a former generation the Josh McDowell book, More Than a Carpenter. Anybody read that book? I've never read it, actually, but it was quite a famous evangelistic book. It sold 10 million copies, I think, in the 70s and the 80s. And Matthew is saying here that Jesus is more than a carpenter, much more than a carpenter. He is a doer of mighty works. Again, that word repeated throughout these chapters. And these mighty works give us a clue as to his identity. And so we want to think about that this morning. We're going to do that under two headings. Firstly, 13 verses 1, sorry, 1353 to 1412. We're going to look at a family drama. And then 1313 to 36, we're going to think about faith and not doubt. Okay, so it's a long passage, but we'll work through it together. And in the first bit, 1353 to 1413, we have these two family dramas. Jesus, firstly, is doubted by his own family. And then secondly, he's in danger from the royal family. 1353, we are told that he goes to his hometown and uh, he's preaching on a Saturday in the synagogue. And people are amazed, firstly, by his wisdom and then secondly, by his works. And this is a really important chapter for understanding the Lord's upbringing We're not told very much about it in the Bible, but we learn here that his father Joseph was a carpenter, a kind of skilled tradesman, maybe a builder. And we're told in verse 55 that Jesus had brothers and sisters, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas are not his sisters here with us. So we're given a glimpse into the Lord's home life. And yet, at this point, People at home, people in his hometown, don't get it. They don't believe in him. They take offense, verse 57, at him. They're scandalized by him. They've heard his wisdom. They've heard of his mighty works. And yet, they're not all that happy with him. Now, it's normally the case, isn't it, if um, somebody kind of famous, is born or brought up somewhere, that they're acknowledged in some way. You maybe think about, uh, you know, a local sporting hero. Somebody gets in the Loch Aber Times regularly, or there might be a blue plaque on the, the wall where somebody was born, somebody was brought up. The school might love its association with a famous person. Uh, might, you know, you think you go to Ayrshire, and it talks about being the birthplace of Robert Burns. This weekend is actually the Masters in Augusta, and uh, Rory McIlroy is playing. I don't know how he's doing. Um, I haven't really been following it. But but if you go to Hollywood in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, not Hollywood, California, Hollywood, Northern Ireland, that's where he's from. And we were there a couple of years ago. And as you drive in, there's actually a road sign with the town name, and it says residence of Rory McIlroy. There is, you know, you know where he lives because uh, it's advertised on every roadside. They're proud of that association. And yet when Jesus goes home, there's no plaque, there's no reception, there's no double-decker bus through the streets. Verse 57, they take offense at him. And they can't quite get past the fact that he is the carpenter's son. They resent the fact that he has this wisdom that he has these mighty works. And he says to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, except among his own household. And for that reason, we're told in verse 58, he didn't do any miracles there because of their unbelief, perhaps a judgment on their unbelief. So we want to notice straight away that the Lord knew rejection. He knew what it was for those nearest and dearest to him to be offended by him and by his teaching. And we mustn't be surprised, therefore, if we as his followers experience something of the same, if some of those nearest and dearest to others take offense at the one we follow. If people say to us, where did you get these ideas? Have you forgotten who you are, where you came from? Do you think you're better than us? Don't be discouraged. That was the Lord's experience. 
And that was his experience all through his ministry. A couple of pages back, 1146, he's teaching and his, his mother and his brothers, they turn up and uh, they say they want to talk to him. Maybe they want to have a quiet word in his ear. And Jesus says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Even if your own family considers you a bit odd or excludes you, says the Lord, you're always welcome in the Lord's family. The psalmist writes, though mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me in. So the Lord Jesus at this point in his ministry was doubted by his own family. We know later that they would come to faith. We know his brother James would write the letter of James and become a leader in the church in Jerusalem. But he was a prophet without honor in his own household. And Matthew then directs our attention in 14 to a prophet without honor in the royal household. And news of Jesus has reached the king. And he's discussing who Jesus is. And he says, rather unusually, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. And Matthew then gives us a little kind of recap of the life and death of John the Baptist. It's a bit like if you're watching a kind of box set and you know you have the different episodes week after week and you have the little two minute recap at the start in case you can't remember what happened seven days ago and it tells you the key plot points well that's what's going on here Matthew's giving us the recap and he tells us about John the fearless prophet who had been preaching against the king he had been speaking boldly against King Herod and his immoral relationships Verse 3 to 4, it were told that Herod uh, had seized John, put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. So Herod was married to someone else, his brother. It was married, uh, brother Philip married to Herodias, and they met, and uh, they both left their spouses, and Herod married his brother Philip's wife. So he was an adulterer. This was against the law of Moses marrying your sister-in-law. It was forbidden in Leviticus 18. Now many in the religious establishment of the day just turned a blind eye to that. But John couldn't do that. He was outspoken and so he spoke out. He spoke truth to power. He called the king to account before heaven's king. And Herod responded by seizing him and binding him and locking him up in prison. Herod shows himself, though a powerful man, to be a very weak man. He feared John. We're told that in Mark's Gospel. He feared the people and he feared his own wife. So John spoke truth to power and it landed him in hot water. But John's life was safe. Um, although he wanted to put him to death because Herod feared the people, he didn't do that. But on one occasion, he's having a party and uh, he's got all his rich and his powerful friends, the military generals, the, the leading figures of the day. And uh, he invites Herodias' daughter, his stepdaughter, to dance before the company. Uh, and it pleased Herod. Herod getting carried away, eating, drinking, being merry, promises to give her whatever she might ask. And that scheming Herodias says, give me the head, through her daughter, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So Herod's just getting carried away. He's with his friends, they're having a good time, he gets a bit carried away, and then he is trapped by his word. And because of that word, verse 9, he commanded it to be given. John is taken and executed, and his head brought on a platter and given to the girl. It's a very sinister and somber chapter. It reminds us that it is actually dangerous to speak truth to power. As Christians, we are to speak out against injustice. We are to be a voice to the vo- for the voiceless and, and to call out wickedness in high places. But it can be a dangerous thing. It can be a costly thing. Watching this week, not a box set, but a film. I don't know if you've seen that film, The Dissident, about the Saudi Arabian journalist, Jamal Kazagoshi, who was very critical of the Saudi Arabian regime 
and it was actually murdered in the embassy in Istanbul. He spoke truth to power, and he paid the price for it. Well, that can be the same for Christians as we call out against injustice or wickedness or evil in society. John learned that. He suffered for righteousness' sake. And you notice what happens then in verse 12. The disciples come and they take his body and then they go and tell Jesus. Perhaps they go to warn Jesus that Herod is on the warpath. He's not taking kindly to prophets. If Jesus, the prophet, wasn't accepted in his own household, then he's not going to be accepted by the royal household. And while his own family doubted him, he would be endangered by the royal family. So Jesus, the prophet without honor. John, thought by the people to be a prophet, a prophet without honor. Matthew teaches us that Jesus is more than a carpenter. He has this prophetic ministry in Israel. But he reminds us that how difficult that ministry is, involving doubt and rejection and danger. And he's going to tell us something more in the next section. And we're going to look in a moment and think about how Matthew challenges us to think of Jesus not as more than, only more than a carpenter, but actually as more than a prophet. But before we do, we're going to listen to a song. We're going to listen to He Will Hold Me Fast, a song that speaks of the Lord as he did with Peter, holding us fast in the difficulties of life. He will. 
Well, if you keep your Bibles open to Matthew 14, and in the next section, Matthew challenges us to think of Jesus as more than a prophet. Um, He's had a busy day, verse 13, and so he takes his disciples away on retreat. He's going away to a desolate place by himself. But it's not easy for him to get any peace and quiet. Uh, Verse 13, the crowds heard it, and they follow him on foot from the town. And it's amazing to see the Lord's compassion, even though he's tired, even though his disciples are hungry, even though he's in danger, what does he do? He has compassion on the crowds and he heals their sick. Very different from King Herod. And as dinner time approaches, verse 15, the disciples say, well, people are hungry and they need to go and have their tea. And let's send them away so they can get to the shops. And Jesus says, verse 16, rather surprisingly, you give them something to eat. And the disciples uh, realize that's impossible. They only have the five loaves and the two fish. In another gospel, we're told that it would be several months' salary in order to feed everybody. So it's an impossible request. 5,000 people, men, women, and children as well, a few rolls, a few fish. And what Jesus seems to want them to do is to recognize the poverty of their own resources so that he can demonstrate the power which he has. He wants them to recognize that he can do a very great deal. He can do a lot with their little. He takes the five loaves, the two fish, he blesses them, he distributes them through the disciples, and everybody eats and satisfied, verse 20, and they take up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces. There were 5,000 men beside women and children. And it's a miracle, isn't it? It's a supernatural miracle. It's a, a miracle of creation. that The Lord takes their little and does a lot with it. And it's a miracle that we we have glimpses of in the Old Testament. You remember Moses in the desert. The people were hungry. They didn't have anything to eat. And God sent to them bread from heaven, the manna. Every day, six days a week, they would be sent manna from heaven. And in the ministry of those two other great prophets, Elijah and Elisha, there were miracles of provision. The widow's oil, this widow, nothing to eat. And Elijah prepares a never-ending supply of oil. And then Elisha, on one occasion, providing bread for a hungry crowd. Second Kings 4, maybe have a read at home. But we, we hear about a man from Baal Shalisha who has 20 loaves of barley and fresh grain. And uh, Elisha says, well, you give them something to eat. Very similar language. And uh, the people say to him, how can I set this before a hundred men? And uh, he says, feed them, and you'll have something left over. And in 2 Kings 4.44, we're told, he set it before them, and they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. So there was a precedent for miraculous provision, miraculous feeding of the hungry. Moses had done it, Elisha had done it, and Jesus does it. He stands in that line of the great prophets of Israel. More than a carpenter, a prophet, but also more than a prophet. And finally, we notice what happens after they fed 
after they've had their tea. At verse 22, the disciples get in the boat. He sends them away. He then dismisses the crowd. And verse 23, he goes up on a mountain by himself to pray. It's evening time. It's getting dark. And the disciples begin to row ashore. Just in passing, we notice that Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. The Lord spent a lot of time in prayer. And he obviously found that mountains were quiet. You weren't disturbed very often. And it was a place free from distractions. The Wi-Fi signal isn't always very good on a mountain. And therefore you can be alone. And I, I think that's a great verse because there's not a shortage of mountains around here. And I myself personally, just speaking personally for a moment, find it a great help if I need time to pray to go along a glen or up a mountain. And the reason is because it's very hard to, to be interrupted or, or distracted. Sometimes, of course, you might meet somebody or in the middle of summer, not quite so easy. But the Lord realized he needed time out. And we have the great privilege here of having plenty of nice beaches and valleys and river walks and mountains. And uh, the Bible doesn't say we just have to pray in a home or in a church. The Lord is the Lord of the whole earth. And it, Jesus went up the mountains by himself to pray. And maybe that's something that would be a help to us if we need unhurried, uninterrupted time to, to be alone with the Lord, to get in the car and to find a mountain. So the Lord's praying, the disciples are rowing, and uh, they row for a long time. He prays for a long time. The fourth watch of the night, verse 25, about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., and they're not making any progress because of the wind. The wind's against them. And, uh, and then, verse 25, they see this figure walking on the sea. They're terrified. Verse 26, they think it's a ghost, and they cry out in fear. But Jesus says to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And this is really interesting what Matthew's doing here, because he's telling us that Jesus is more than a carpenter, more than a prophet. In the Old Testament, again, there is only one figure who can walk on the sea. Psalm 77, the psalmist says, Your way, O Lord, was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Job chapter 9, verse 8, Who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples the waves of the sea? Only the Lord God can tread upon the waves of the sea. And then Matthew says, look at the language in verse 27. When Jesus says to his disciples, take heart, it is I. The words he used in Greek are the words that are used of the covenant name of God, the name given to Moses, I am. So we have one who, who walks on the water as God in the Old Testament was said to walk on the water, we have one who says, I am, when they think he's a ghost. And it's no surprise, therefore, when they get into the boat, verse 33, that they fall down and worship him and say, truly, you are the Son of God. All through his gospel, Matthew is dropping these hints from the beginning of the gospel where Jesus is our Emmanuel, God with us the sealing of the storm when he is God with us as they pass through the waters. So the chapter began with the question, is this not the carpenter's son? And it ends, verse 33, with the disciples confessing, truly you are the son of God. More than a carpenter, more than a prophet. Now with the artist Banksy, it doesn't really matter um, who he is. It would be nice if he came and painted on some of our buildings and added millions to their value. But either way, it's just kind of a matter of interest, isn't it? Who is Banksy? But it matters who Jesus is. And it matters what he is able to do with those who have faith in him. This chapter is a contrast between the mighty works, the wondrous works of Christ and human weakness. Verse 17, the disciples have little food. 
and yet he's able to feed 5,000 people. Peter has little faith, and yet he's able to get out of a boat and to walk for a short while on the water until he focuses on the wind instead of Jesus. It shows us what the Lord is able to do, how he can take our little and do an awful lot with it, how powerful he is and how he can turn our weakness into strength. One of the books I read recently, this one here, The Spiritual Revolution, the story of Operation Mobilization, this great uh, missionary movement of the last century. And OM, in February of this year, celebrated 50 years, the 50th anniversary of their ship ministry. They, they bought a ship in 1971, sailed around the world, led conferences, gave out literature, ran medical clinics. And yet the idea for a ship really came at an unusual time. They'd been um, transporting people different places, usually in cars and vans, driving to India. And they thought it'd be cheaper if we just bought a boat. The problem was, none of them could sail. They didn't have a boat. They didn't have any money. They didn't have a crew. And yet they believed God could provide. They trusted God. Peter here needed faith, verse 29, to get out of a boat. But the people of OM wanted to get into a boat, and they had to show the same remarkable faith. And here we are, 2021, celebrating 50 years of a ship ministry, millions around the world impacted for the gospel. William Carey, the founder of the Baptist Missionary Society, said this, expect great things of God, attempt great things for God. Peter had to get out of the boat, verse 29, in order to walk on water. I just think that's a word, isn't it, for all of us in life. I think naturally we tend toward that which is comfortable and familiar and safe. And yet as Christian people, we are commanded sometimes to step out of the boat, not to step back from our responsibilities, but to step up and take on responsibility, not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in faith in Christ, who can use a little food to feed 5,000 people, who can use a little faith to help somebody walk on the water. One writer says this, leadership development is the crucial bottleneck to church growth. There is a worldwide lack of men and women called of God and deeply taught in the scriptures to lead the churches, people willing to suffer the burdens and responsibilities of leadership for the sake of the Savior who redeems them. As Christian people, we are called to step out of the boat, not to look at the problems, not to look at the wind, but to look to Christ and to trust that his power would be made perfect in our weakness. And that is only possible because he is more than a carpenter. He's more than the son of a carpenter. He's more than a prophet. He is, in fact, the son of God who turns our weakness to strength. He wants to bless us that we might be a blessing to others. He was doubted by his own family. He faced danger from the royal family. He faced doubt from his own disciples. And yet he called them to faith, promising to use them in faith. So we pray this week, maybe none of us necessarily trying to buy an ocean-going vessel for the Lord's work, but in whatever sphere he has called us, that we might be those who have faith and do not doubt, who bring to him our little and ask that he would do a lot with us and with all that we lay at his feet. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for calling us to yourself, calling us into your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that you do not call us to an easy or a comfortable life, but you call us to a glorious one. And we pray that we would not be ashamed of your call. We would not be afraid of others or the response of others but that we would know that you are the one who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. 
You are the God who turns our weaknesses to strength. So as we seek to live and work and worship and witness in a world which is sometimes indifferent, occasionally hostile, a world which is filled to overflowing with needs and wants, pray that we would be like the young man in this passage who brings ourselves to you, who lay our resources at your feet, that you might bless them and multiply them, and that you might do good through them to a hurting world, to a hungry world, that we might bring glory to you, our holy God. We thank you for the example of former generations, for that great cloud of witnesses. And we pray that you would help us in our generation to bear testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ and to leave a legacy for those who are following behind. And so we thank you for this time this morning. Lord, we thank you for our fellowship and our partnership in the gospel. And help us in the days ahead to be people not of fear, but of faith. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.